Um, so with uh, so you've gone so we've kind of laid out the different the six steps in gathering evidence about the sales and collection cycle, and so now at this point, right, you've gone through the audit of that business process. Now you want to evaluate your audit findings. Right? So you're going to look at um, you've completed the plan substantive procedures. Now you want to look at are there any potential misstatements? Are there any misstatements? Um, and then you have to project those misstatements. Because remember, you're trying to gather evidence about the risk of a material misstatement, right? Is there a material misstatement? And we'll talk more about this, the sampling risk when we talk about the cover sampling. But you have to look at, remember, you're, you're taking a sample. You're not looking at items 100%. You're taking a sample of items. And from that sample, you're going to project what if, if you find errors in your sample, for example, you have to now project that, those errors to the entire population. So for example, if you, have, if you looked at 500 transactions out of 1,000, right? And you found, you know, uh, in your, in your um, 500, you found 10% error, you know, errors amounting to about 10% of the sample size. You have to project that, you can't just show that those errors as your misstatements, your likely misstatements. You have to project the, that 10% to the entire population. So you have to project that 10% to the 1,000 transactions that occurred. That's your likely misstatement. And the reason it's likely is because you don't know with certainty that that's a misstatement. You're only basing that on your samples, your samples testing, the results of your sampling. Then you also have known misstatements. And those are the misstatements that you can identify, right, without, without any uh, estimate. So for example, if you are confirming accounts receivable um, and the client has, you confirm with a customer, the client had uh, the customer's accounts receivable as being $500,000. But when you got the customer confirmation back, the customer said, oh no, we only owe 400,000 because we returned those goods before year end, right? We returned those goods on 12-30-2013. So we only owe them 400,000. And you go in, but the client still has 500,000 posted. The difference between the four and the five, the 100,000, that's a, that's, a, that's a misstatement, right? That, that account is misstated by $100,000. So that's what I mean by a known misstatement versus sampling gives you a likely misstatement. Another example of a likely misstatement is if you find um, uh, a difference in what the client has recorded for the allowance for doubtful accounts and what the, the auditor calculates the allowance for doubtful accounts to be. The reason for that, that that's a likely misstatement is because, again, Allowance for doubtful accounts is an estimate. It's your best estimate given the evidence that you have. If you and the client, if the auditor and the client has a difference of opinion and the client agrees with the auditor, okay, yeah, we should probably increase the allowance for doubtful accounts by, let's say, $50,000, that is a likely misstatement in, in allowance for doubtful accounts, right? You see the difference between known errors and likely errors, right? Mostly likely errors are coming from estimates and from sampling. So the auditor has to consider those errors in total and look at those and say, what is my misstatement? So is your likely misstatement, if your, your misstatements are less than your tolerable materiality limit for that account, right? If it's less than a tolerable materiality limit level that the auditor set back in the planning stage, then you can conclude that the account is fairly stated. Why? Because it's not material. The differences are not considered material. They're less than a tolerable misstatement, right? I'm sorry, less than a tolerable uh, materiality level uh, that the auditor is willing to accept. If it's greater than that number, right? So if it's greater than tolerable materiality, then the auditor is going to conclude that the account is not fairly presented. So what do you think happens? When, if the auditor concludes that the account is not fairly presented, 
do they give the client a qualified opinion? Adverse opinion? What? And what did they do? Couldn't they still give them an unqualified opinion? Then that would be a qualified opinion or an adverse opinion. Right, they suggest, right? They propose a change, right? Because if you found, you've done the audit, you found the errors, so what you would propose is you would make a proposed, uh, propose an adjustment that the client would book. And by booking that adjustment, then the accounts are no longer misstated, right? Right, so if the accounts, if the, now, and it's the client's books and records, the, the auditor can only propose the adjustment. What do you think happens if the auditor proposes the adjustment and the client says, I'm not booking that, I don't think you're right? Right, they can issue a qualified or an adverse opinion. But who is the auditor? Well, th that would be a big step, right? But they, of course, they can resign from the client. You know, they can resign because they could say, we're not going to issue an audit opinion. We're not going to issue you a clean audit opinion. We're going to issue an adverse opinion, um, and the client might fight them. But who does the, the auditor report to? No, the audit, well, the audit, the audit firm. Who does the audit firm report? The, the audit, committee. audit committee, right? So they report to the audit committee for that client, right? Not just not for you know, just for that client. They report to the audit committee. The audit committee hires the auditor. So the client, the, if the auditor and the client uh, found themselves in a situation where the auditor was proposing an adjustment. And this is big. It, would, it obviously has to be material, and the auditor feels very strongly about, if you don't book this adjustment, then there's no way we can issue a clean opinion on this. Before they take the step of issuing an adverse opinion or a qualified opinion, they're going to talk to the audit committee. That's the audit committee's role, right? The audit committee has oversight over the financial reporting process and the auditing process uh, as it pertains to that company. So it's the, audit, the auditor has a responsibility to report these types of things to the audit committee, especially if they're unable to resolve these issues with clients. There's this, uh, and in the standard, and I'm sorry, I can't remember the number off the top of my head, but in the standard, there's a standard that basically says, that deals with communication, the auditor's responsibilities for communications with the audit committee, and it talks about these types of things. Okay, so before they got to that point, they would obviously bring these types of issues to the audit committee. And, um, but if the client, I mean, ultimately management is responsible for issuing the financial statements. And so if the auditor feels as though management and the audit committee, because the audit committee doesn't have to side with the auditor, right? Um, and if they feel that it, you know, the client is not uh, willing to book it, they can issue an adverse opinion or they can withdraw from the audit engagement. 